all of you. Uh, thank you for coming, and thank you to Chief Whalen from the Dennis Police Department and the other folks that he's brought with him today who he'll be introducing. We're here to talk about um, the event of an emergency on Cape Cod, specifically for people that have individuals or loved ones with disabilities. And um, anyone else that has issues or questions or concerns that have to do with what we would do in case we did have an emergency here on Cape Cod. So I'd like to introduce Chief Whalen. Mike Whalen is the Chief of Police in Dennis and the Emergency Management Director for the Town of Dennis. He is also the Vice Chair of the Barnesville County REPC, which is the Regional Emergency Planning Committee, and Chair of the Sheltering Committee. Prior to coming to Dennis, to his appointment here in Dennis, in 2004, Mike was the EMD, which is the Emergency Management Director, and, and the Police Chief in Farmington, Connecticut, and Vice Chair of the Capital REPC region. Chief Whalen has been involved in emergency management function in, in several Connecticut and Massachusetts venues since 1975. So Chief Whalen's um, well versed to um, instruct us in this emergency preparedness seminar. And so let's give Chief Whalen a hand. Way of history. Uh, I came to the Cape, uh, as Julian said, in uh, 2004 from uh, Washington Shore from Connecticut. And uh, I remember the first season I was here, uh, my friends in Connecticut before I left told me, of course, we've been coming to the Cape for a long time, but they told me, oh, you, when you get to Cape Cod, it'll be great. It never snows there. It's wonderful there. You know, sell your snowblower, get new golf clubs, because that's what you'll be doing on Cape Cod. And then the first winter I was here, we had 110 inches of snow and one storm over three feet, and uh, I didn't play any golf, and I was cursing why I sold my snowblower. Uh, but the other problem we had that uh, came up that year and came up the following year, if you remember, in December of 2005, the year after we had all the snowstorms, we had that freak storm on December 5th, 2005, where at 3.30 in the afternoon on December, it was beautiful, it was like 60 degrees, it was gorgeous, and at 4.15, there were trees down all over the place, um, there were buses stuck um, in live wires in Brewster, there was... Um, power out all over Cape Cod, and I think it was probably the first time, or if not the first time, one of a very few times, uh, that we actually asked uh, NSTAR to turn the power off to Cape Cod so that we could get people out of uh, dangerous situations and get them taken care of. Uh, the other problem we had in, in the uh, storms of 2004, 2005, and then the 2005 storm was we had a very chaotic system for sheltering on Cape Cod. Each town was responsible for their own shelters. Uh, what would happen basically is one town would hope that the town next door opened a shelter first because we uh, frankly didn't have the people or the resources in place to properly run a shelter. We didn't have an animal component. We didn't have uh, components that could help people with disabilities in the shelter. It was basically open the door to the nearest school, throw some cots on the floor, go get some peanut butter crackers at the, at the stop and shop, and hope everybody stayed, you know, relatively warm and safe and, and dry. Uh, it was reactive, and in, in, in by that I mean that we didn't uh, plan for shelter openings. We just, when something really bad happened, we said we need a shelter after the fact, and then we'd open one. Uh, and so we started looking at our problems, and of course, in 2004, the federal government came out with new rules on sheltering after Katrina. <laughs> And they said, you need to do a better job of sheltering. You need to provide services for people with disabilities. You need to be able to provide services for people that bring pets to your shelter. You need to be able to do all this stuff. And we looked around on Cape Cod and we said, we can't, we can't do it under the system that we had in place at the time with some 33 shelters across the Cape. So the Red Cross came to us and they said, you know, is it possible for you to look at regional sheltering? Now, I don't know how many here are longtime Cape Cod people. Okay. So you longtime Cape Cod people know how Cape Cod goes, right? It's a it's considered a day trip if you have to go from East Ham to Dennis, right? <laughs> you pack for a week. Uh, I remember when I first came here from Connecticut, I had a retired uh, police officer from Dennis grab me one day and he was we were talking, he said, Oh, he says I got to go over to Bridge today. And I said, oh, where are you going? Are you going to Boston? Are you going to Providence? He said, no, I got to go to Hyannis. 
and, and, I was, and, and it dawned on me that, that, uh, that Cape Cod, not unlike most of New England, but particularly here on Cape Cod, people are very parochial and they like their town, they want to stay in their town, and so that provided some very um, uh, big challenges for us uh, from, a, um, from a sheltering standpoint, because if I tell somebody in Dennis, you're going to DY High School for, for a shelter, they're like, I don't want to go to Yarmouth, I want to stay in Dennis. Or somebody in Chatham says, I don't want to go to Harwich Tech, I want to, go, I want to stay in Chatham. Uh, so we started out in 2009 with this process to try and come up with a regional sheltering approach, and I'm happy to say that we continue to make great progress today, and we've now had the regional shelter process open on, I'd say, probably over a half a dozen occasions now over the last three years, and each time we get better at it, uh, and each time we, we do a better job at, at uh, providing for our clients, and uh, uh, we will continue to get better at it as time goes on. So uh, we, we came together the Cape Cod Law Enforcement Council, the uh, Barnstable County Fire Chiefs, the DPW departments, the Regional Emergency Planning Committee, which is, makes up all of the emergency management directors, police chiefs, fire chiefs, town administrators from all 15 towns on the Cape, and the Southeast Regional Planning Group, which is the money people, they're the ones that have the money from Homeland Security and they sit up and talk. And we put together a regional approach and we brought together all of our, what I call first responder partners, uh, our non-government, what's referred to as NGOs or non-governmental organizations like Red Cross, Cape Cod DART, CERT. Um, we brought together the DPW people, our health agents, uh, police and fire, uh, emergency management directors, and we brought them all together and said, how can we come up with a sheltering plan that works and, and it doesn't have 33 spots that people can go to. Uh, and uh, I was fortunate enough to be uh, delegated by our chairman uh, of the uh, Barnstable County Emergency Planning Committee to uh, run the sheltering committee, and along with all these fine people that you see, who I'll introduce in a few minutes over to my left, um, we set out to, to put this program together. And what we did first was we broke the Cape down into three sections, Upper Cape, Middle, and Lower, which is pretty natural, I think, for a lot of people when they think about Cape Cod. Uh, Mid Cape is pretty much uh, Dennis, Yarmouth, and Barnstable. Uh, Upper Cape is Sandwich, Bourne, uh, Mashpee, and Falmouth. Uh, and then uh, Lower Cape is everything pretty much east of uh, Dennis criteria. Well, first of all, it had to be a place that wasn't going to be under four feet of water if we had a flood or a hurricane or, or some kind of a flood issue. Uh, it wouldn't work for us too well if, um, if the uh, shelter was in the floodplain. So we had to make sure that from a location standpoint, all of our shelters were in the right place. Then we had to look at uh, safety and uh, efficiency of the shelters. We had to look at the design of the shelter. Um, and of course, we had to work with what we had because we didn't have uh, we didn't have a lot of money to build any places. So we basically looked at the shelters we were already using and see which ones we thought were the best. We tried to stay away from schools that had big glass areas because in, a, in a wind condition that could be dangerous. Um, we we tried to stay with uh, schools that had uh, good uh, generator uh, resources so that if the power went out, we'd be able to keep them running. Uh, and then we looked at some other things. In every one of our um, shelter reviews, um, we had folks from CORD with us who are here today from uh, uh, Cape Cod Organization for the Rights of the Disabled that would walk through with us and they would slap us on the hand if we looked at a place that didn't meet all their criteria for accessibility. Uh, and if they saw things that didn't look right to them, they pointed them out to us and we'd work to get them fixed. Uh, and most importantly, we needed places that could provide comprehensive shelter services. And what do I mean by comprehensive? I mean, uh, the Medical Reserve Corps would have an area so that they could work and provide additional health services to people that needed them that came to the shelter. Um, that Holly and her animal group um, could have an area that could provide um, sh uh, shelter for animals, people bringing their pets. Uh, and of course, you know, that's something that schools are concerned about. A principal doesn't want to have a bunch of animals in a, in a school and then not be able to clean that up and get ready to start school again. Um, so animal sheltering was one of the challenges we had to get by and, and so far we've been able to work pretty well with that. Uh, we needed to have uh, an area for communication so that the shelter could talk to other shelters and talk back to MEMA and 
to the um, uh, emergency operations centers for each town. And so uh, Frank and his group from the amateur radio group uh, came in and set up uh, resources at each of our shelters so that um, they can talk. I think they could talk to China if they needed to, uh, <laughs> but they could certainly talk to the uh, what's called our multi-agency multi coordination center in uh, BOTUS, and they can also talk to each of the other shelters and they can talk to the town emergency operations centers. And we needed to strengthen the overall preparedness of the communities uh, in a way that didn't tax the first responders. What we do in Denison, I can't speak for the other towns, but pretty much we all do about the same thing. Uh, when there's a big storm coming and we're preparing for it, basically we take our police department and we split it in half. Half of them work a 12-hour shift from 8 in the morning to late at night, and the other half work from 8 at night to late in the morning, and that goes on until, the, uh, until we're done. Um, at, we're answering calls on the street. We've got wires down. Typically, you've got problems. People may be stranded in their homes, need to get out. There could be any kind of problems uh, with, a, with a large uh, disaster that your first responders are going to be tied up with. So if I've got to put five or six people in the shelter, I just don't have the people to do that. So that's why we count on our other groups um, and uh, volunteers to be able to run the shelter with minimal number of uh, first responder people there at the uh, shelter. So what were we designing for our shelters? Well, our original plan was to have each shelter be able to do over 500 to 1,000 clients. That was our original thought. We wanted each shelter to be able to do 500 to 1,000 people. Um, and we could, we could do 500 people uh, in some of the shelters if we had to, but we certainly don't have enough cots, um, uh, beds, and so forth to house 500 people. Uh, when we finally uh, put together a plan from a money standpoint to get the money to buy the resources for the shelters, we were able to do 300, uh, 350. So, we, so that's where we are right now at 350. But our original plan was to do 500 to 1,000. In addition to the six shelters that I'm going to tell you about today, there is another shelter at the Mass Military Reservation in Otis that the state runs, and that's part of the uh, traffic plan. That I'm not really here to talk about the traffic plan today, uh, but suffice it to say, and, and you'll tell from, the, from what I tell you that I'm not really keen on the traffic plan, but because um, frankly I don't think it's going to work. But uh, basically what the traffic plan has in mind is that we're going to tell you three days before the storm's coming that we're going to have this really bad storm and it could land anywhere from New Jersey to Maine, um, but that you need to leave Cape Cod now and get on the road and drive at the speed limit off the Cape and go somewhere else. Um, now, again, many of you here have been on the Cape for a long time. I'm sure some of you were here for Bob yeah. back in 1991. People didn't leave the Cape, no. and they're not going to leave the Cape. And um, so our, what we've said, and the group here that's with me today and others and our, our police chiefs have basically said that the traffic plan is probably not going to get people off the Cape like you think it's going to. So what we need to do instead is make sure our shelters are able to accommodate people that by the time it's, by the time they're ready to say, okay, I'm leaving, it's too late to get off the Cape, but at least they have somewhere to go. So we have the 3,000 person shelter um, at Mass Maritime, uh, Mass Military Reservation, and that can open if need be. And that's not run by us, that's run by uh, state uh, Massachusetts Emergency Management, but we'll run that along with the Red Cross and other people. Uh, so we have our six shelters, and I'll show you the map in a minute, show you where they are. And they can, right now, we can, we can account for 300, um, 300 to 400 people at each of those six shelters and take care of those people pretty well. Uh, on top of that, each, there's a local community shelter in each town that has about 50 cots stored away, usually in a middle school or elementary school. And if something happened at the last minute or it was a quick thing that was local to one community and not involving a, a regional disaster, uh, Red Cross and the town could open a small shelter for 20 or 30 people uh, and on a local scale instead of on a regional scale. So th those are our three uh, basic plan designs for the shelters. And here's where they are. Uh, Upper Cape Falmouth High School. For those of you that might have heard this talk a few years ago when we gave it, I think about three years ago when we were starting out, we talked about Mashpee High School. We don't use Mashpee. 
Um, we don't use Mashpee High School anymore. We use Falmouth. Uh, it's, a, it's a better facility from an emergency management standpoint. So Falmouth High School and Sandwich High School in the Upper Cape, um, Barnstable High School and DY uh, Regional High School in Mid Cape, and then Cape Cod Tech and uh, Nauset Regional School on the Lower Cape. Now, how many people here know where those, at least half of those places are if you had to go there? Oh, good, all right. Uh, each shelter was surveyed. What we would do is we'd get a group like the group you see here, and we would go out to the shelter. Uh, we would walk through the shelter with the engineers and the custodians and the people, usually the principal from the school, and we would look at all the different areas that we wanted to put things in and make sure that the school was okay with it. Uh, then we, read, we would come back. Red Cross would set up a, um, what they call a, a, a facility survey and sign off on that with the school on a, a shelter agreement. Um, Cape Cod Dart, Holly and her people would go back and figure out how they wanted to set up their crates for animals and so forth. Um, the Medical Reserve Corps people would make sure that the, that the school or the area that we're going to would, would work for them for their uh, medical folks. Um, Frank and his folks would come out and do communications and maybe put an antenna on the, on the roof um, so that we could get out and get communications if we needed it. And then, the, as I said, the cord people would also be with us, and they would um, walk through the school and make sure there weren't any accessibility issues, or if there were, they'd point them out to us and tell them what needed to be done to, to rectify the situation. We also sat back and thought about who's going to come to our shelter. If we have to open a shelter, who's coming? Um, we, we were doing great until um, this past February when Nemo came along. Uh, we would usually get, in the other times we opened a shelter, we would get about maybe 10, 15, 20, 30 people. One storm, I think Irene, we had 100 show up for the DY shelter. That was the biggest group we ever had. And 50 of those were kids from a football team outside of Boston. Their coach brought them down here even though there was a hurricane coming and they couldn't get to the camp, so they came and stayed with us for a couple of days. But we had pretty much not had a, a full shelter. Uh, in, the, in the course of the three years we had been running shelters. Then Nemo came along in February. This past February, um, we didn't open all six shelters. We only opened three. We thought that would be enough, and we got slammed. And I got to tell you, if you were at the DY shelter on Saturday night, uh, it looked like the emergency room at Cape Cod Hospital. <laughs> One after another, the ambulances were just backing up to the door at DY and uh, bringing people in that had oxygen generators and oxygen tanks and medical issues. And so this, uh, the reason I tell you the story is because the capacity assumptions that we dealt with when we first started this process called for maybe 20% of our people needing some type of disability facility and then t 10 to 20% of our people needing some kind of additional medical care. Um, after Nemo, I got We're going to be knocking those numbers up because I think um, it's probably closer to 40 percent or 50 percent of the folks that come to the shelter have some kind of medical need or some some kind of assistance that they would need at the shelter. Uh, then we also looked at the difference between winter and summer. Uh, uh, quite frankly, as much as we prepare for hurricanes, and that's like our thing uh, on Cape Cod, uh, we get hurt much worse with our winter storms than we do with our summer storms. And our hurricanes are usually here in August or September, um, and we are in hurricane season as of today, June 1st, so just keep that in mind. Uh, but the bottom line is um, we, get, we get hurt much worse with our winter storms than with our summer storms. Anybody have any idea why? What, what's the difference between summer and winter? That, what's that? Yes, the heat. Um, usually, if, if you know Irene or or Sandy or one of these storms comes through, uh, even a heavier hurricane than what we've seen over the last couple of years, uh, even Bob, you know when Bob left, uh, it got nice out. Uh, it wasn't that cold, uh, and while you might not have had electricity for a week, you could pretty much deal with it. Um, when we get when we had Nemo come through in February, people were cold, yeah. and they were cold for a long time. And, they, and so they couldn't stay in their house. They had to have shelter because they just couldn't stay there. It was too cold. So um, as much as we plan for summer issues with hurricanes, really we found so far our winter storms are much more 
problematic for us than um, summertime. All right, so here's what one of our regional shelters looks like, uh, and it might be a little difficult for some of you to see some of that, but basically this is, this is DY High School, and you can see that, um, I'm be able to move around a little bit. I can't carry two microphones. Uh, just over here is the pet registration. So over on the northeast corner of the building, there's a lower gym. Uh, area, if anybody's familiar with DY, any DY folks here? Okay. So we've done this for every one of the shelters, I'm just, but I'm not going to show you all six of them, I'm just showing you one. Uh, and we have a registration area, so when you come in with your pet, you can register, and then the, the pets are segregated because we don't want to make extra pets while we're at the shelter. So <laughs> we, have, we have cages for all the pets, and the cats go on one side, and the dogs go on the other side, and uh, there's two locker rooms downstairs. Uh, that Ali has configured, um, and and a lot of times we just make decisions on the seat, you know, by the seat of our pants as we go along. When Holly first started the program down at DY, um, we were going to put plastic on the gym floor and then put the crates on the plastic, and as you know, that can mess up the wood floor. So we found the two. She found the two locker rooms down there worked out great. The shower areas, and so the cats are on one side and one shower area and the dogs are on the other side in the shower area and uh, and um, you know they don't sneer at each other or yowl or <laughs> whatever they can do. Uh, and, it, and she has some food down there and, and, and the, uh, the owners come down during certain times of the day to walk their pets and there's a walk area out there that they can walk their pets around and that kind of thing. Uh, over here when you come in from Station Avenue this area right here is where the people come in. Um, so if you have an animal, you go around one side, drop your pet off, and then you come back around to uh, register for yourselves. Uh, and that people registration is in that area, for those of you that are familiar with DY, it's right by the cafeteria and the gym area. Um, so the gym ends up being the dormitory where people s stay. And then um, uh, the registration is done in the hallway and if we get a big surge of people we put people in the auditorium and they can sit there and then we bring them out one by one to get them registered. This area down here which is the, which is the uh, medical uh, area, uh, the health uh, nurse area for the school nurse and so forth, that's where the MRC people go and they set up, their, uh, they'll set up down there with, the, with stretchers or with the cots that are already there and they can provide medical assistance to people that might, might need them. Uh, our CERT people, Citizens Emergency Response Team, help with the traffic and so forth, bringing people in and out of the area. Uh, we can bring ambulances in. There's usually a firefighter, EMT, or paramedic on duty uh, and a police officer there. And then there's a, a, what we call a branch director, who's the person that runs the show there. Red Cross takes care of all the people registration. Uh, and uh, that's pretty much a layout of, of what a shelter uh, looks like. And this is just another picture, but you can see here uh, you've got uh, folks uh, going into the uh, upper gym and the auditorium to stay there. We had, for Storm Nemo, we had uh, 325 was our highest count at one time for people, and we had over 500 come through the shelter over the five days it was open. I think East Ham was over 150 and Falmouth was, um, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere around 140 or 160. So we had a pretty good crowd of folks at the different shelters um, with Storm Nemo, and that by far was our highest number of shelters, uh, uh, people in a shelter since we opened. One of the things we learned from Nemo, in the past we've always looked at and said, well, maybe we don't need all six shelters open, maybe we'll just open two or we'll open three. From now on, whenever there's a storm that meets the criteria to open shelters, we're going to open all six, because it was difficult for some people to get from, you know, from like Chatham down to East Ham. They'd much rather have gone to Harwich Tech, but that wasn't open. And by the time we figured out we needed more shelters open, it was too late between the snow and everything else. We couldn't get those buildings open. So from now on, we'll open all six shelters. Our plan is we open shelters before the storm starts, so you can go to the shelter before the storm hits, and we don't close the shelters until everybody's safely back home. 
Here's uh, kind of what the, what I refer to as the symphony looks like for the shelter. You have a branch director. The branch director kind of runs the show at the, at the shelter. There's a Red Cross group. Uh, there's a DART group, which is the animals. Uh, the MRC group, uh, which is uh, health, additional health care. You have the Aries group, which is amateur radio. That's uh, Frank's uh, group, and he's going to talk about that. Uh, you have the facilities group, which are the people at the school. And um, if any of you know Rooney from um, DY, she's the, uh, the food services director for DY. She, she was in a shelter for all five days, worked around the clock, provided food not only for the DY shelter, but provided food for all the other shelters that didn't have food. And uh, she cooked over a thousand meals um, uh, over the course of, uh, well, it was well over a thousand, I mean, probably closer to 2,000. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day Meatloaf on Monday. In fact, the governor liked the meatloaf so much he took four meatloaf dinners back with him when he left the shelter. Uh, you know, hot food at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, sandwiches out all the time. I mean, listen, it's not the Ritz, okay? But you can, you can, get, you can get food, you can get juice. If you have uh, issues like diabetes, um, uh, they can take care of uh, food for that. Um, if you have a gluten issue, you know, she's used to dealing with those kinds of things with the students, so she's able to do it for us, and, and we don't really throw any curveballs that she can't hit out of the park. Um, so she did a fantastic job for us, and, uh, and we uh, plan to now make her like the full-time cook when we have to open the shelter. Uh, we had this great plan for what to do with sheltering, but we didn't have any stuff. And then about a year and a half ago, uh, we made a pitch to the uh, Homeland Security Council who, uh, that oversees all the funds that come out of Homeland Security out of Washington. And we said, look, for two years, the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, its number one objective has been regional sheltering and moving away from local sheltering. We've got a plan, <laughs> but we need stuff. And we were able to get $100,000 a year and a half, uh, two years ago now. Uh, we outfitted six boxes. Uh, these container boxes, the metal conix boxes with all of our stuff. And as I said, we now have enough equipment to do um, 350 people at each of our shelters. We can do a little more at DY because we had already bought some stuff between Dennis and Yarm before we got the other stuff. Uh, and uh, right now we can do the 350 at six shelters. The uh, Mass Military can do their shelter. Uh, we have animal sheltering and Holly will kill me because I always say we can do animal sheltering. Um, if you know anybody that likes to work with animals, Ollie's always looking for volunteers because the one thing that we're always short of are people to help make the thing work. So I know Red Cross, every one of these folks, when they get up here, I'm just giving you fair warning, when they get up here, they're going to make a pitch for volunteers. So if you know anybody that can help out, um, we are always looking for volunteers because Frankly, if we had to open, um, if we opened all six shelters, we'd probably only have animal sheltering at three right now. Yes, sir. Because that's all Holly has people for. She has equipment for the other ones, but we don't have enough people for now. And then uh, we have a Medical Reserve Corps at all the shelters, and again, they're, they're also kind of tight on people, so um, if we open all six shelters, they may only have MRC people for four, or they may have a skeleton crew at two and a full crew at four. So we're always looking for volunteers. That's the one thing that, that's always tough for us. And here's that stuff I was talking about just to give you a heads up of what is in the shelter. We have, we have blankets. We have uh, air pillows that you blow up. Uh, they're not very comfortable. Uh, we have special needs. We have two kinds of cots. We have regular cots and then we have special needs cots. So for our seniors, we, um, we have cots that are a little higher. Than, uh, than the regular cots. Uh, we have cots, some cots that, that will um, uh, have a higher capacity uh, weight-wise. Uh, we have uh, dishes for the animals. We have crates for the animals. Um, we have uh, a couple of fans to keep the air moving because it gets very hot. Um, we have signage. Uh, Cord provided us with some ambulatory um, tools that I'm sure they'll probably talk about when they come up. but. Um, we have some walkers, wheelchairs, uh, TTY. Uh, we have some other um, things at the shelter that, that they were able to provide for us. We have some cribs. Um, if you're really lucky and you get to the shelter late and we've run out of cots, you get a foam pad. 
that just lays on the floor basically and you can sleep on that. Actually, we try to put the kids on those because they don't really care and it keeps them from falling out of the cots. Uh, and then we have other things like uh, jugs for water and uh, extra blankets. We have comfort kits. Uh, we have a uh, comfort kit basically has a toothbrush, toothpaste and a washcloth and that kind of thing in it that we give out. Uh, and that's pretty much all we have. As you can see, it's not the rich. You don't get a, what do they call them at the West End, the dream bed. We don't have any of that kind of stuff. All right, we already talked about current abilities. Uh, we talked a little bit about disability-related equipment. Um, so I told you about what we have there. And, and you, I may as well tell you first, because the rest of these folks are going to probably tell you the same thing. The fact that we have these things at the shelter doesn't mean that you shouldn't be prepared to bring your own stuff, all right? Your medicines, um, any equipment you need, any durable medical equipment you may need to get around. We, our philosophy at the shelter is whatever you do at your home, you do at the shelter except you just got 500 other people watching you, that's all, okay? So if you take care of yourself at home, we expect you to take care of yourself at the shelter. If you have somebody who assists you at your home, then you need to bring them to the shelter so they can assist you at the shelter. If you have equipment that you use at home, then you need to bring it to the shelter to assist you at the shelter. Um, if you have medicines at home, you know, you should have, uh, you know, the, the little boxes that kind of lay out your medicine. You should make sure that you have a box like that and that it's full for at least five or seven days because you may be at the shelter for five or seven days. So make sure that you've got all your medicines. Um, we cannot get CVS, Walgreen, they won't come to the shelter. So what we had to do with Nemo, by, by Monday morning, people were running out of medicine because they didn't bring it. Uh, we had to pile everybody onto a bus that needed medicine with a firefighter and a National Guard guy, and they went back around to everybody's house so that they could get their medicine. Now, by then, some people were snowed in, they couldn't get in their house or whatever, so make sure you bring your stuff with you when you come to the shelter. And if your animal needs medicine, Holly's going to tell you, make sure you bring your animal's medicine. All right, so are you prepared? Uh, Why should we all prepare? You are in the best position to prepare for your own safety because you know your own abilities and what your possible needs may be in an emergency. No one else is going to know that. So when you go and all these lovely folks try to help you out at a shelter, they don't know about what your needs are, you know, what, the, what gets you through your day. So you need to be sure that when you get to that shelter, you bring with you everything that you need because they have possibly five, 499 other people that are also going there at the same time. So you just want to be as well cooked as possible. So what do you need to do in order to get this done? You should create a personal support network. So there should be somebody, not just one person, try to think of a couple people, and try to build the network from people from different places where you generally spend your day. So say you volunteer somewhere, maybe there's a person there that you could count on, or you have a job, or you go to school. Just think about your networks, a neighbor. Make sure that these are people that you can trust and that can check in on you to see if you need assistance if something was to happen. And don't just rely on your PCAs, um, the personal care attendant. So some people with disabilities use a personal care attendant to help them with their activities of daily living. Um, unfortunately, and you know, they were saying if there's somebody that helps you at home, you should bring them with you. Unfortunately, they also may not be able to leave their home. So you need to think about, is there somebody else that could be there to assist you in that, in that time? Make arrangements for your support network to contact you like to check up on you if a disaster happens. Give them any, like an important key to your home or to your car, something like that. Um, show them where you keep emergency supplies and share copies of your emergency documents. Um, you know, try to have these relationships be mutual so you can be their contact in case of an emergency as well. And think about completing a personal assessment of what your needs may be. So think about individually, what do you need to think about? You know, are there certain things that really only affect you for daily living, personal care, medication? We recommend a 30-day supply to have. Um, one way to get that accomplished is to kind of rotate your medication and set up one of those sets that he just spoken about. And then don't, for, don't forget, though, that things do expire, so you're going to have to refresh that every once in a while. 
um, water, personal care equipment, adaptive feeding devices, electricity dependent equipment. Think about getting around. If there's debris from this disaster, trees, Storm Nemo, there's a tree that fell right in front of our house and they didn't, um, it took them about a day and a half to clear our road, so we, we couldn't leave because they had blocked the road. It was beautiful. <laughs> Transportation, errands. What if your caregivers can't reach you? You know, what do you need to have in the home? And evacuating. How are you gonna leave your house? How are you gonna leave your street? How are you gonna get help if you need it? If you need mobility aids, ramp access, service animals, pets. Just keep everything in mind about, you know, what it is that you might need to help you in order to get to a safe place. So if disaster does strike, listen to the radio or television for the location of the emergency shelters. As I said, now all six will be open. So just think about which one's closest to you and which one's going to be the easiest to get to. Um, shut off the utilities if they instruct you to do so. Wear appropriate clothing and sturdy shoes. Don't forget your bright red disaster kits. Um, lock your doors and windows, use appropriate travel routes, and um, make sure when you get to the shelter that it, accommodate, it can, can accommodate your needs. So go up to one of the people working there and say, this is what I'm dealing with here. What can you do to help me? Where do I need to go? Just so that you know you're at the right place. And inform your support network and your family of your location and your safety. So for service animals, um, Make sure your service dog has an ID tag with both the home number and that of a primary out-of-town contact person. Create an animal care plan in case you have to evacuate. Keep your dog secure to leash or confined if they may become distressed during an emergency. And create an emergency kit for them. So think about a bowl for water and food, a seven-day supply of food, a blanket, plastic bags, paper towels, anything that they would need for minor wounds, and an extra harness and maybe some toys to get them a little bit more comfortable. And then for specific disabilities, so if someone has a cognitive disability, communication is an issue, you might want to help them practice or, or practice yourself what to do. Um, keep, keep a written emergency plan on that person. Maybe if they have a backpack that they always have, something like that. Um, as I said before, give copies of the plan to people in their support network. Think of ways to help you remember important things. So there's a specific thing you're supposed to do. Practice that, keep it written down, something you could show somebody else. Um, it, you know, if you need a communication book or written explanations, just different ways to communicate. Determine how you will communicate with emergency personnel if you don't have any devices that you use. So create some kind of plan for that. Um, store paper, writing materials, and pre-printed phrases in your emergency kit. So if you need Ready to write, you know, where's the restroom? Things like that. Anything that you think that you might need to help you. And store batteries or chargers for your equipment in your emergency kit. If you are diabetic, make sure that you have enough supplies for four weeks if possible. I know it's hard to get that much stored up, but if you can, the, the more you have, the better. The better prepared you'll be. Um, watch for the expiration dates, of course. If you're not feeling well, call your doctor. If you're unable to reach your doctor and out of medications or food, go to the nearest hospital, contact the police, go to an emergency medical center, and try to wear one of the medical alert ID bracelets at all times, so if there's someone found you, they'll be able to know what's wrong. Um, so store your supplies in a plastic box in a handy dry area. Um, make sure you have your blood glucose meter, some strips, lancets and lancet device that you use, insulin if needed, and the supplies. and. Um, <coughs> the oral medications. So whatever you take, if you are di diabetic, make sure you bring everything with you. Also, try to bring prescriptions. So if you are able to, say, go out to the doctors or go up to pharmacists again and you need to, to refill, make sure you have a prescription handy or you have enough prescriptions at the pharmacy that you go to that's close enough that you could just say, okay, I need more of this. Um, also bring a glucagon emergency kit and a sharps container for disposal of the used supplies that you have. Um, insulin must be kept from bright light, extreme cold, and extreme heat, so just be, weird, you know, just be careful about how you store your items and try to keep a good supply of the sterile syringes and lancets. Um, 
So they talked about um, talking to your doctor about what kind of foods you should bring with you, especially if you're diabetic. That's a really important piece. Um, just trying to make sure you have the right stuff, not just, you know, a bag full of candy. <laughs> you know, like the last thing you get out of the house. Um, and some tablets in case you do have low blood sugar. But I guess you could pull out the candy then. Um, and a manual can opener. And you should always check your food and medical supplies at least yearly to make sure that nothing's gone bad. Like that. If you use a life support system, you should secure equipment to prevent damage from falling. If you use a chain, make sure it's welded, not bent. Determine which facilities can serve you if your home system becomes inoperable or inaccessible. Ask your vendor about alternative power sources that will sustain you for up to seven days. Think about if you can manually operate such equipment. Can your equipment be operated from a vehicle battery? Just think about different ways that you can get your equipment to work. For all day use over several days, a gasoline power generator is the preferred alternative power source. And some generators can be plugged into your home wiring systems, and you can consult with your utility company about that. Uh, make sure that you regularly test your backup power supply and teach your personal support network how to operate and safely move your equipment. Some tips for the visually impaired and um, people who have issues with mobility. If you're visually impaired, keep a spare cane in your emergency kit. Store high-powered batteries, uh, flashlights, um, label supplies with large print, fluorescent tape, or braille. Anchor your special equipment, such as computers, and create a backup, date, uh, backup system for important things. Um, place security lights in each room to light the paths of travel. Advocate that the TV news announce no important numbers slowly and repeat info more frequently. And plan on losing the auditory clues you normally rely on following a major disaster. So just think of an alternate plan. For mobility, store needed aids in a convenient and secure location. Compile the emergency kit extras, such as an extra wheelchair, scooter battery, patch kit for your tires a lightweight manual wheelchair if you have one available, a pair of heavy gloves, arrange and secure furniture and other items to create barrier-free passages, and practice using alternative methods of evacuation in case you can't go out the way that you normally go out. For someone with environmental chemical sensitivities, um, collect emergency plot supplies based on your worst day. So if some days you can handle things and some days you can't, Think about the emergency situation as a day when you cannot handle anything <laughs> and you need to have like the utmost protection. So if you have a charcoal mask or respirator, rolls of aluminum foil for covering seated areas, baking soda for washing, food that requires no cooking, portable charcoal water filter, collect carry with you supplies to keep near you at all times, your health info um, cards for with details, your medications, and any um, homeopathic remedies and supplements that you use. And know where the safest places are away from your home. If you have these types of disabilities, going into a room with 499 people is going to expose you to a lot of different, even just say perfumes. And that cannot, you know, might not mesh well with your health. So just think about that and think about what you can do to protect yourself in that environment. For individuals with psychiatric disabilities, practice how to communicate your needs. So maybe write down, I have a um, psychiatric disability and may become confused in an emergency. Just have our little card and write down you know, what, what could help you. What could someone working with you do to help you? Anticipate the types of reactions you may have after a disaster. So I wasn't happy to have heat or water <laughs> you know, for three days. And if you imagine someone with a disability is not going to be happy either. So think about, okay, what, how might I react to this? And what might I be able to do to, to reduce my anxiety or whatever, tr whatever your triggers are? Because that's going to trigger anybody. So just think about that. And of course, keep your emergency health info cards. And if you have a durable power of attorney information with you in case you have been hospitalized. Because if they were saying if 10% need medical attention, there, there may be a situation where you're not able to speak for your own needs. Has everyone heard of the silent 911? Silent 911. Okay, I didn't bring the sheets with me today, but if you are at your home phone and you dial 911, you may not be in a position where you can tell the operator what's going on. So if you press one, two, or three, I believe it's one for police, two for fire, and three for ambulance, mm -hmm. then they'll dispatch those um, services. 
If you need more than one of those services, you just pause in between and then they'll send out whoever, whoever is needed. Um, we had a, there was a, a consumer who lived on one of the islands who had MS and her PCA put her to bed with a cigarette in her mouth every night. Unfortunately, that didn't work out one day. And does everyone know who the first responder is when someone dies 911? Police, police. <laughs> police come out first. So unfortunately, once they realized there was a fire and there's someone in there, time had just you know gone on too far. So they created this system as a way to have people be better prepared. And I thought of it as well. You know, if someone was breaking into your home and you're hiding in a closet, and you can dial 911, but you don't want them to know where you are, there's you know that's another use for that. So just remember that it doesn't work yet on cell phones, but I'm sure that it will come up to speed with technology soon. Um, we advocate that everyone create a personal emergency preparedness plan, and CORD can help you create one if, if you need to. And we're at 106 Bassett Lane in Hyannis, and you can always call us if you have any questions. Um, there's a couple other tips I have for anyone who is deaf or hard of hearing, so I'll just tell you those. Um, a disaster supply kit should be readily available with extra precautions in the event of an emergency. The supply kit should include extra hearing aid batteries and an extra hearing aid if possible. They should be stored in a waterproof container and kept in a secure place. You should carry paper and pen so you can communicate with others. Um, service dogs are allowed to be in the shelter with you, but you must bring food, dishes, collar, and a leash. When you get to a shelter, let them know that you are deaf or hard of hearing and ask them how they will notify you of emergencies, instructions, or when it is time to exit the building. Ask if there will be signs to point you in the right direction as to where you want to be. For example, if you're going to the registration desk or the restrooms. Bring your cell phone, pager, or the text system that you use so you can communicate with your family or network. And make copies of your important papers such as insurance, prescriptions, birth certificate, and bring all those items with you. Um, the regional shelters, I believe, are, are equipped with pocket talkers and a TTY system. Right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> So does anybody have any questions? Good afternoon, and, and thank you very much, Chief Wallen, for inviting me to come here. Um, my name is Ann Jacobson, and I'm a volunteer with the American Red Cross, this eastern region, and Cape Cod and Islands chapter. Uh, so it's, it's us that works as a partner, Red Cross as a partner, to government and to other organizations in terms of protecting people and helping uh, during a disaster. Uh, you often see things in the newspaper, on television, and it's much more, it's very dramatic. Um, hopefully we don't have so much drama here, uh, but we have had our own, um, our own problems and our own experiences, but this is a great place to work, because I will tell you that everybody works together. So each of us has many, many responsibilities, and Red Cross has a huge responsibility because we essentially are doing the, the sheltering piece. So you meet us at the front door when we ask you to come in and register. And it's at that point that we <clears throat> often screen for initial uh, disabilities or needs. <clears throat> and the reason that we do that is so that you can be then um, turned to, to uh, one of the nursing staff. It could be a Red Cross nurse. I'm a nurse. Uh, we have Red Cross Health Service. So we do have health service uh, within the Red Cross itself. And we work together with Medical Reserve Corps. And so together, we have a nice uh, working um, unit to help you and to go over and see what are some of your needs. Is it a special cot? Is it special food? Um, but keep in mind, it's really, really important what Chief Whalen said. And it, it is it's difficult, because we want to make things like home for you, but it's not home. The shelter just isn't home. And we can't really replicate home. It's a disaster. It's not the Ritz. It's not a hospital. It's not a clinic. We don't have a pharmacy. Um, we have medical personnel, we have nurses, and we have doctors, but we're not running a clinic. If you're at home and functioning at home, uh, or your family member or your friends are functioning at home, they, they need to essentially bring that with them to the uh, shelter. The shelter provides a cot. It provides warmth and a roof over your head. Uh, food and we're trying to work on that to make it uh, somewhat improved and, and better for people with special needs, what types of diets that people need. Uh, but in truth, it's not home. And so there are things when we say we need your help, 
we have to work together, just as Red Cross works with Chief Whalen and other agencies, and we work with CORD, and CORD works with us, we educate each other, we help each other, we're in a partnership. We need you, you're the key partner, okay? And right now it may seem like, oh my God, it's so overwhelming. I know for me, the first time I started to make my own emergency kit, I said, I can't believe what I have to do here. Um, but I made a kit for my house if I was sheltering at home. And that might be a very common thing to do during the summer because it's warm. We don't have to deal with that. And if you have gas, you may actually be able to cook, yep. okay, even during a storm. Unlike me, who has to cook my pasta before. Okay, because I only have electric. So you, you have to think about some of these things, what your environment is and what you need in your specific environment. And while we have lists of things, and many, many lists, and Karen, you know, Catherine made a whole long list, don't get, don't get frightened by it. Sit down and look at what do I need from this list? What are my needs? If you don't need a wheelchair, then you don't need batteries for the wheelchair, okay? But if you have a wheelchair and you need it, then you need backup, okay? Now some people say, well, I'm just gonna get a backup generator, I've heard that. Well, have you ever priced a backup generator for your house? It's a bit pricey. There are some people who can afford it. There's a lot of people that can't afford it. And also it presents certain dangers that has to be, you know, in terms of the safety of the house. So that's not an answer for everybody. And that's why we have, that's why we have community sheltering, so that, um, many people might not come to us. They might be at home uh, and stay at home in the, the warmer weather. Not possible in the winter weather. Don't even think about it during the winter. We <coughs> won't make it. My neighbor tried. She made it about 12 hours and she said, I got lonely. I said, you weren't cold. She said, I got cold too. <laughs> okay. Um, so there are things that you need if you shelter at home and they can be prepared in advance. There are things that you have to have in coming into a shelter and it's your responsibility. Now, when do you do this? I don't expect you to run home and start making this kit, but I would say plan it out. Look at your calendar and say, this is the week that I'm going to do my, my, my evacuation kit and my home kit. First, I'm going to make the first step is making the list of what works for you, okay, what you need, what your needs are, and the second is sitting down with a family member, a friend, an aide, whoever it is that helps you, and make that kit, okay? Um, I was with my mom in New York City taking care of her during Sandy. I wasn't deployed with Red Cross, I was with her. And I thought I was so smart, right? I made that kit, I had everything. I checked those batteries, okay? I made sure we had three gallons of water or four gallons of water, I forget. But I, I thought I was so smart. Well, what I wasn't smart about, the area that she was in, the power went out, but the, what she lived in had power, okay? Because they had their own generators. Well. I forgot that when it's that bad and all the stores went out of electricity, so did all their food, it went bad. So it took about two weeks for the nearby stores to replenish their supply. Well, I had about five days worth, but I had to get the kids from uptown to bring the supplies down. So there's some things, you know, you try to remember and you try to think about it, but you can't always. You try the best you can for what works for you, keeping in mind that some things may be out around you. You may not be able to get cash if you don't have cash, okay? You may not be able to buy or get that prescription if CVS is closed, okay? And also, do you really want one of the volunteers from the shelter to go to the pharmacy to bring you medication, go out in the storm and do that? Because that's what it comes down to. Human beings, just normal friends, neighbors who work as volunteers, they're gonna have to go out there and, and, and get that for you. So you must plan in advance. What are some of the things that are crucial? The medication, okay, a minimum of three to five days, a minimum. I carry in my purse 10 days supply of my medication, okay, uh, at a minimum. Now, how do you get that? Well, it, don't stop taking your medications in order to save a pill, okay? If, if you, um, it, it's very hard to do this now because they're watching everything, you know, and it's hard to kind of get that stuff extra. Um, Talk to your doctor if you, if, in, in terms of planning ahead, and they may be able to give you a little extra on the prescriptions ahead, something, some things you can't get that, so that you don't run out of, of the supply. So you have that two week supply of medication should it not be possible to get it. But definitely bring into the shelter at least five days supply of medication. And those little boxes are really great because you can set them up. Um, your, as you mentioned, your diabetic supplies and your colostomy supplies, oxygen supplies, okay, it's not that we can't get these things, 
But do you, do you think we can get them very quick? We don't keep them um, in, in storage, and the reason we don't is because they, they become um, unsterile, and they're not, uh, they, they, don't, they don't stay well in a hot Connex box. So we don't keep medications in there, and we don't keep uh, any kind of th this type of supply. But if you have your own, we may be able to get something, but it might take three days to get it. So that's not going to work very well if you really, really need something. So oxygen supplies are very important. Um, your toiletries aren't just your washcloth or your underwear and your socks, okay? And obviously, it might be something like your Depends. <laughs> you know, we have some of this stuff. I'm not saying we don't have it. We have, in the health kits, we have a very large bin of this type of uh, material. And we also have a huge amount of medical supplies, non-medicine type things. We could probably run a hospital with that, but not quite, okay? We've got lots of Band-Aids and that sort of thing. Um, so you don't have to bring the first aid kit to the, the shelter. Um, we said to bring a change of clothing. It's a little bit more difficult. In the winter, well, they had to go out and buy, uh, I forget how many pairs of socks for people at one of the shelters because everybody had wet feet, okay? Um, I can't tell you how many pairs of clothing has left my, my trunk. My emergency clothes have ended up on somebody else's feet or, or back because I go out with the Red Cross um, emergency team uh, during the month, I go out. When you, when you hear about fires, it's usually in Cape Cod times. They'll say Red Cross was there. Well, I'm one of, one of the people. There's many, many others who do it more than I do, but I go out periodically. Uh, and also, if there are health issues at that time, I help with that. Uh, bring your walker, cane, and wheelchair. Uh, we had a situation in which people either thought that we'd have these things there for them, or those who brought them thought that it would be available to them. I'm not saying we don't have a walk or a cane or a wheelchair, but we don't have a lot of them. And so we ask you to bring your own and label, of course label it, and most of you probably have already done that. Um, and if you have routine care uh, performed by a personal care attendant or a family member, they should come and stay with you. Now what do I mean by that? If you have someone who comes and cleans and does the dishes, that person, <laughs> that's all they need to, need to do because you can do everything else, Then. You, that person isn't necessary at the shelter. But if you have a person who helps you go to the bathroom, shower or wash or clean up, I mean, you can't do these things without this assistant. They need to be there with you. Do we have people who can help you? Yeah, there's always a volunteer who can do that. Are they experienced or knowledgeable? Not necessarily, okay? Um, can I guarantee that at the shelter you're in, there'll be enough people to help you or you won't have, you know, have to wait a long time? I can't because we're doing the best we can. It's a disaster situation, all right? So that if you really need that person so that you're comfortable, uh, then they have to be with you. We can't provide that type of care just to, to everybody. We just don't have the ability to do that. Uh, and some comfort needs, such as a blanket or book or magazine that, that you might need. Very important, and what we talked about the differences between the summer and the winter. Um, again, a lot of times the summer you, it's warm, winter it's cold. Also, a lot of family members and friends, people who help you all the time, they're not here in the winter time, okay? <laughs> so you gotta plan, if you, know, if you have a name listed down or you say, well, if I, I need some help, this neighbor's gonna come and get me. But they spend three months in Florida in the winter. You need somebody else to help you with that. Questions that you have right now? Okay, you all gonna get started on that kit, especially the evacuation kit. I'm gonna pass out, or it hasn't been passed out already? It was passed out, okay. This little flyer is a work in progress. We're still tweaking it, it's not perfect. Um, we hope by July 1st it will be perfect and we'll get it printed up. Um, there may be a few things added onto it. But there's, if you see there's a preparation for a shelter. Um, that list is a lot shorter than the one on the other side, okay? And the reason it's shorter is because all it takes is a little suitcase to put all this stuff in, and it can be right there and ready to go uh, for our first hurricane in the season. I look forward to seeing you. Okay. Thank you. We deal with companion animals, not service animals. Service animals are well covered by CORD and by the Red Cross. So what we do is we are a support agency for you in these times of disasters, wherever it is that the RNPC tells us we're going to end up being, whether it's whatever, whatever three of the regional shelters. What that means is if you come in and you care for your animals. So what my suggestions are is, thank you, 
we start with magic. Three days worth of dog food. Okay? And what I do, because what is the Cape Cod Times newspaper bag best for? Scoop and poop. So I put a meal in each bag. No. One of these days I'm going to have to do that. No, don't. So I put a meal in each bag. That way I know I can keep a count. I have six of those. I have three dogs and a cat. And frequently I have at least two of my animals with me at every one of these shelters. So when I've used up one of these, I know what I'm using the empty bag for next, don't I? I've got some canned food. I don't feed them, this is less, less than a cup and a half. I actually feed my animals less when we go into an emergency shelter situation because all they're doing is laying around in the crate. Yeah. Okay? Then I've got a bag for treats. The important thing that I really want people to remember that is really helpful to us, how many of you have your rabies certificates? Very nice. That is huge. If you have your rabies certificate, you can call your vet, you can go home tonight, you can call your vet, and your vet will either email it to you or fax it to you. And that on your rabies certificate has all the information that we really need to know. Yep. It has your name, your address, the type of animal, whether it's spayed or neutered, or whether it's got rabies vaccinations or not. We're not really worried about the rest of the stuff um, because there's nothing that we can do about it if your animal has a certain type of disease, if it's contagious, um, we have a right to refuse entrance to the shelter. Everybody understand that? We are not animal control officers, we're not vets. We're also volunteers. So we are not going to take an animal into our shelter that might put other animals at risk. That means if we have a dog that doesn't like other dogs, if we can crate him away from other dogs, we are happy to take them. I have a dog that doesn't like other dogs, but she always comes anyways. She's marked accordingly, and she's separated from the other dogs, and it works out just fine. So what, the, what we ask people to do is get these certificates. I to encourage my folks to change their, their kits over every season. So I just sent out a message to all of our volunteers today to remind them that it was hurricane season. Get your go kits ready, and get your animal go kits ready. My go kits will stay packed now, until the start of blizzard season. So that I'm ready to go whenever my boss over there tells me it's time to go. I also keep, whoops, I also keep my licenses in my emergency go kits, my animals licenses, um, so that I know where they are. And I don't put them on my dogs because they always have, they're in the water or in the woods or something and they always lose those. So that's for the dogs. I also include toys. More toys. Yes, I have big dogs. And something like peanut butter, which can go in the con. Kibble goes in the con. It'll keep them occupied depending on the animal. It might be 10 minutes, it might be an hour. Mine doesn't seem to last that long. So we've got that in there. I've got an emergency vest in case I have to take them out to do their business at night. They're on a collar, they're on a leash. I've got a backup of that. But at least with this, it's reflective. If I'm out and I was out during Nemo and I was out during Sandy and I was out during Irene, I mean, and I try and keep my guys in that, if by chance they get off their collar or their leash, at least I can see them in the darkness with a reflective vest on. The cat, who is not in here, by the way. Litter, food, she's got her own little well, uh, I don't pack dog bowls for the dogs because we do happen to have those. We've got food and then we actually use these in the shelter for kitty litter pans if that's what we need. So all I generally do is put this into a stop and shop bag, put this on the bottom, throw all this stuff in, the cat goes in there and we're off and running. Now one of the things I would suggest about preparing emergency kits for your pets or for you 
make it one item a week. Buy maybe a collar this week, a leash next week. That way you're not stretching yourself financially if that's a problem, but you're also thinking about it. A lot of times people will rush out and do it all now and then forget about it. We encourage people to do things one week at a time and that way you're thinking about it. So that's the cap. My cap, I don't know about the rest of you, those of you, some of you that have cats. I have one cat, she doesn't take vaccinations because she has allergic reactions to everything. So when she goes into a shelter, we isolate, not isolate, segregate those cats from the rest of the cats so that they're not infecting anybody. So we, we intentionally have worked out plans in all of our shelters for this sort of thing. Um, we generally start hearing about these events, these disaster events about a week in advance, so you have plenty of time to prepare yourself, and I suggest that you start thinking about that. As soon as you start hearing there's a storm, just double checking everything. One of the things we're going to start working on, hopefully CC DART by the end of this year, is have our registration forms online. So if you hear that there's a disaster coming and you're thinking you're coming to the shelter with your two cats, you can go online and download the forms and fill those out before you get to the shelter, which will just speed up the process. Um, at one point during Nemo, when we had people just coming in and coming in and coming in, um, a lot of people were just, they waited too long and it just held up the whole process. So the best thing that you can do for you and your pets is to be proactive and to be prepared. And I think that's about it for me. Okay, I guess everybody can hear me. I usually talk in a pretty loud voice anyway, but thanks, I'm Frank O'Loughlin and I'm with the Amateur Radio Emergency Service, I'm also a meteorologist and uh, usually brief the uh, REPC and others about the upcoming weather events. Um, I usually do a lot of um, presentations about what we should have in kits, those type of things, and they vary upon applications. But I have found that it's best to do, like Holly did, a live presentations rather than just have a list. It's, it's important to put something that people can see in front of them, because uh, that's how you remember things. And one of the first things that comes up, of course, when we talk about the power goes out, what's the first thing that happens? The lights go out. And lighting is usually one of the most dismiss things or it's something you rarely need so you don't think about it too much. And I know at one point you know, we're doing these types of things. I was the same as a lot of people at a flashlight. Never got used, so lights went out. I went and I grabbed it out of the drawer after stumbling down the stairs and I turned it on. It glowed for about a minute because the batteries were dead and it went out. And that's not really what you want to do. There are a lot of good ways to light today. They're, and they're cheap, they're effective, and they're easy to obtain. And one of, the, one of the best things you have these days is uh, LED lighting. And it's a big difference today. What LED lighting is different is in the past we used to have batteries and they'd light a bulb up, a filament just like the old light bulb. And, but most of the energy was dissipated in, in heat, so it didn't last very long. But with LED, it's a diode. And there it used to be a fad, but it's very, very uh, available now. This uses several LEDs. But the important thing is it doesn't dissipate a lot of energy and heat, so the batteries last a tremendously long time. So you can have a, a lantern like this, you could put a couple of D cells in, you know, and it's possible that you could turn this down as well as you need it. You'll find you need less light as you go as your eyes adjust to a darker environment. For some people, I mean, if there's, if there's vision impairments, it's a whole other different story. But it's possible for lanterns like this, instead of running on a bulb where it may last only a couple of hours, these can last a couple of days. And that's a big, big difference. And you can buy them just about anywhere, Kmart. Harbor Freight is in town now. Job Lot has them. But if you find anything in Job Lot, you've got to buy it in two days and you never see it again. You know, <laughs> things are there. So this is one type of, of uh, lantern. It's actually an older type. This is one that Job Lot had. This uses a new type of LED, very bright. And it really comes up. It has a hook. Runs on some D batteries. And on low power, which is has a blinking emergency type too. But on low power, I had one of these running during Nemo and after two and a half days it was still on. So on one set of batteries. So it is possible to really get a lot of time out of these. I remember, we all remember the old lanterns and then of course there's the oil lanterns and things of that nature. But with new technology, this is really something good. And these were available at Job Lot, they're about $20 or so, which may seem like a lot, but it doesn't after it bails you out. 
can tell you that. So it's very, very nice. Um, lights themselves have become very small. This is one that has uh, just a few LEDs. This runs on a single AA. And some of the more modern ones, this is actually a little bit of an older one, there are lights now that can burn almost an entire day, two or three days, just on, a, on one or two batteries. So it's a big difference from the old D-cell battery uh, lights that you saw. Fits in your pocket, and you can just put uh, just a single Duracell in. Some of them run off triple A's as well. And you'll find, you go to Home Depot, any of these places, sometimes there'll be packs of two or three of them, and sometimes they're not even $10 for a pack of many of these. Have a bunch of them. Always carry one in your pocket, even if you're in your own house. Because what I wanted to talk to you today about is you're going to run into basically three situations. You're going to go to a shelter, you're going to be sheltering in place at home, or unfortunately you may be on your way to a shelter and not get there right away. And if you're in any of those other circumstances other than the shelter, you're going to have to take care of yourself. Because the most important thing is life. Comfort comes second. You have to be around to, to, to be comfortable. So that's part of this. This a lot of people laugh at, but until you find that it's usable, this is a headlamp. Yeah, you look kind of like a surgeon or whatever. But these are adjustable. And you can buy these. But the important thing is it keeps my hands free. If I'm looking at doing something in the house, I'm cooking or whatever, or I'm looking for a leak or anything happens, looking for medicines, whatever, this is my way of keeping my hands free. And you can get these for, you know, the same place as I mentioned, Harbor Freight Depot, other places for ten dollars or so and they this will run also for a full day on a set of batteries some of the newer ones two days so it's really really effective um, other lighting issues I think I that's about it I have for, for lighting um, so the next one I want to get to any other questions on lighting by the way um, the LED it's the way to go light emitting diode so it's actually a piece of electronics that emits light and uh, of a certain color that we can see, and it lasts a long time because it doesn't get hot. So that's very, very important. Next thing I want to talk to you about is cell phones. Everybody thinks that cell phones are always going to work. Well, they don't. Uh, Jan and I were on April 15th, tax day. We were at the Boston Marathon, providing communication support until 2.50 p.m. And we got word via radio that the bombs had gone off. A minute and 30 seconds later, the cell network was unusable because everybody called up and made sure that their sister and brother were okay. Remember Y2K? Yeah. The big thing that they were afraid of was everybody's going to pick up the phone at midnight and then the system would go down because everybody picked up the phone. Well, that's what happens with cell phones too. And in real storms, we have problems with cell towers can go down as well. So there are some important things you need to know about cell phones if you do have them. Uh, some people have smartphones, some people just have regular flip phones. Very simple Ziploc type bag. What do we use that for besides keeping our sandwich fresh? We can put the phone in it. So I can put my phone inside the bag if I am in a wet environment. Well, not the flip ones. You have to be able to see through this. But as you can see, I can still use the touch screen on my phone even through the bag. So I could leave this on a table zipped up. It could be raining or whatever. Hopefully your roof is still on. But either way, in a wet environment, the phone is still usable and you're not worried about it short circuiting and going dead on you. So that's a big issue. And we all have these floating around. So it's not like you have to buy a million things as well. So you just got to get good bags. Charging the phones. The other thing we wanted to bring up, and it's been brought up before, bring your AC charge if you're going to a shelter. Hopefully, you'll be able to plug in. Uh, it's not a bad idea to bring one of if you got one of those multi outlet strips to bring that too. So if your friends or people beside you need to charge their phone, they can as well. Now, if you're at home and the power is out or you're in the vehicle, you don't have that option, do you? So you have to charge another way. A couple ways you can do it. If you have a computer. You can hook it through the USB cable, hook it in, put it into the phone, and it's very simple. You put one side in the USB, and the other side goes into the phone. I won't do it here, but and you can charge it. So if you have that laptop that isn't doing you any good because you don't have any internet anymore, because you have it tethered on the phone, 
you can actually use the laptop to charge your phone, even if you don't have any power and you don't have any generator. If you're in the vehicle and you don't have that option, you can do the same thing with this. You can buy these at Job Lot, little cigarette lighter put in, and then you could just hook that cable in, same cable in, and charge your phone that way in the vehicle. If your vehicle isn't running, you can get a AA charger. This is a single AA, but there's a lot of them now that have two and three alkaline AA batteries. You put them in, and you can charge your phone that way without the vehicle or the AC. And all it does is kill the AA battery, which is okay because you can buy them cheap. Um, you can go to BJ's or any place and buy a ton of them. These are important, and you can buy these Amazon.com, Brookstones, a lot of different places online. They're available. You could save your neck. So think about that. It's very, very important. Other thing I want you to remember about cell phones, I don't want to take up too much time here, but is that when this system goes down, it's it's voice phone calls that are the problem on the network. Usually what we'll find is that you can still text, and very often you can still email, but it's the voice calls that use up all the bandwidth on the tower. So during the marathon, if we could still text, group text or point to point, but you couldn't make a phone call. So plan accordingly with your loved ones if you want to keep in touch together that way. Really, really, really critical. Let's see, a few other things to show you. Yeah, you want to bring the charge with you, of course. That's kind of important. We talked about radios and all the kits. A lot of kits today have the little radios. This is one of the Red Cross little types of radio. This is actually one of the good ones, the old ones. Um, this has three types of power. It has a solar cell. It has batteries. It has a wind-up. So, I can put that. Almost sounds like the old siren during World War II in an island. <laughs> Either that or somebody's angry. But, you can actually listen to what's important and what's going on that way. It really is important to have that. And it runs off three sources of power. There, there are a million different types of these, but they're very inexpensive, and you can buy these in, in many different places. It's a good thing to have in the kit. A lot of kids come with them now, but three sources of power. That's the critical thing. Let's see, where are we? Uh, some other issues I wanted to talk about. And uh, this is kind of one that's, uh, if you're in the car, things of that nature, don't forget to have a little multi-tool, not just a pocket knife, but the best time to go is Home Depot. After Christmas, you find these things for about $1.99, $2.99, and you've got many, many different, sort of like a Leatherman tool, only $1.99. Really, really good, not $79.99. And these are can fold up and be put anywhere. Put one in your kit, buy a few after, after New Year's when the sale is on, because they want to get rid of them. But make sure you get it before February, because the price goes back up. And uh, these can go a long way in, in helping you. Uh, other thing I keep, when it's winter time, this happens in the West a lot. People get out of their cars for whatever reason. It's freezing. They can't get back in their car. It's frozen. Windows frozen. Have a little tiny pack of this de that you can get. Also good to keep a can for the windshield in case you, you, know, you can't actually defrost it properly. This will allow you to go around the windows and the lock. Try to get back in the vehicle. Auto zone for a couple of bucks. Way to go. Also, remember to have your little an extra key. I'm not going to tell you that. Probably most people realize that. Other thing, this came up during Sandy and a bunch of other things. People, I know one guy went out and he had a ton of bushes of baked beans. I'm all right, I got all the food I need. When he went to open the can, he didn't have a can opener because he had an electric can opener and he didn't think about it. So, especially a lot of the older folks, they wouldn't have leave home without the old manual can opener. Sounds silly, but it could mean the difference between eating and not eating. Uh, trying to use the one on a pocket knife or something, not much fun. Best go to Christmas tree shop or wherever you want to go and get one of these for a couple of dollars. You probably have one hanging around someplace. Other thing, I want to talk about your glasses. Remember the old Twilight Zone episode? He thought he was all set until he broke his glasses and then he was the last man in the world that couldn't see. Uh, have an extra pair if you can. They're expensive. If, if that doesn't work, you can always take your last prescription 
where you still can see out of it a little bit and you've already paid for and have that in the kit as a backup you know just make sure that you know you still can still see with them but that might save you a few hundred dollars in doing that but if you can afford an extra pair have an extra pair because the moment you think they won't break they'll break and you won't be going down to lens craft just during the emergency I can assure you so that's very very important uh, a couple of other things I wanted to bring up. This kind of uh, became a big issue during a few others. Uh, have a radio for people to, so you can hear what's going on. There are cheap two-way radios that you can get at Best Buy. Uh, you can get them at Staples. Little family service radios, you can get uh, a pair of them for like $35. It's a way to keep in touch with neighbors loved ones, people that are within a quarter of a mile. They're very simple to use. They run on like AA or AAA batteries. And it's a way, if your cell phone, especially if it's a real big disaster, things aren't working, you can keep an eye on people. Because there may be a case where you can't get out of your home. And your neighbor can't get out of your home. And you'd be able to know what's going on, and they'll be able to know what's going on. So they're available at Radio Shack, different places like that. They're called families, FRS, Family Service Radios. Sometimes they might call them GMRS. But just they're the, the little unlicensed walkie-talkies and they go about a quarter mile, and they're a lot better than the old types that were CB and that type of things. In DC, they have a network for these, and they usually put them on channel one, and when they had that little earthquake down in, down in the south, that's how they knew what was going on around town, uh, because the cell phone overloaded, so that was the only way that they had besides broadcast radio to know what was going on. So that's kind of a big deal. I'm not sure if I have too much else. Uh, well, a couple, of, a couple of oddball things, and then I'll I'll be quiet here because I've probably used up my time already. So, uh, things about the fridge and things of that nature. You know, one, one thing that really works, people haven't tried it already. If you know the power's going to go out, you're pretty sure it's going to go out, you have some time, make a ton of ice, put, put the ice in the freezer, put it in the fridge. Ice in solid form will stay colder a lot longer than the air will in the, in the refrigerator or the freezer. So that's one way to make it last several times longer than it does. Try that. It's a really, really big deal. And let's see if I had anything else on the list that I've forgotten. Nope, I think that's about it. Uh, if anybody's interested, I do have some of the list of some of these things and some of the sources where they're available. Any questions from anyone? Thank you, Frank. He always has all the toys. <laughs> and he's got Dan. He's got like Dan's like the Vanna White of Aries. <laughs> All right, Gainer and Melissa, do you want to come up and talk about the circuit? Gene, Gainer's got Melissa. Yeah, and I am Melissa. Hi, my name's Gainer Foster, and uh, I'm the coordinator for the Yarmouth Dennis Cert team. And the acronym for Yarmouth Dennis Cert team is um, obviously Yarmouth Dennis Community Emergency Response Team. We're a fully volunteer organization. Um, we're sponsored by both towns of uh, Yarmouth and Dennis for um, the police and fire department. And um, I'd like to thank you for having us. This was a great turnout. And uh, before I forget, there were, uh, this lady in the blue dress she asked about, there's so much information that's being presented here. There, if you haven't picked some up already, there's a whole bunch of brochures all on the tables. And all the information that most of everybody talked about are in these pamphlets. And um, I brought some specific ones for uh, other people. But on this big one, I just wanted to say real quick, that it's very, very uh, handy. In the back two pages, there are uh, phone contacts, emergency numbers, and how to uh, prepare an emergency plan for your family. With any disaster, um, your personal safety always comes first, your family and your property. You know, then you can check on your neighbors and, and so on and go around and, and help them as well. Um, the mission for the CERT team is to, uh, it, it came about after 9-11 um, for people helping people um, under the auspice of FEMA, Federal Emergency Management. Um, they uh, realized that there was a big need for people and volunteers in a community to help each other because you know all these uh, natural disasters, terrorism and all that stuff, they uh, realized that the uh, EMS services are way overwhelmed. So if you can help yourselves first and your neighbors, you know, uh, there was a st statistic that I looked up and I, 
uh, forgot the thing, but the chances of uh, surviving an event when you have immediate help is it's totally way, almost 100%, uh, depending on the medical situation. Because if you waited for EMS to get to, uh, like in Hurricane Sandy down in, they couldn't drive down the roads. They actually watched the whole street. They, they couldn't get to the fires for the houses. Unfortunately, they just, that they were helpless. So um, we do, uh, there's classes that go on uh, we're going to try to do every year for uh, if people, and you don't have to join the team, the emergency response team. It's a class, it's a seven week class um, that you go through and it teaches you how to prepare yourself, your family, your home um, for survival in these situations. Uh, it, it's a great program, it's free of charge. Um, we usually do it either in Dennis or Yarmouth at one of the fire station or police stations. Um, it's fantastic knowledge. And we brought these to-go kits. These are um, actually issued to us as um, after they graduate. Harley dropped a tag. Oh, she's not here. But, um, the, ooh, rope. Hmm. Stay away from that. Um, you, you uh, ladies and gentlemen, you got a basic kit. Uh, of uh, items that are in your uh, kits from the Red Cross. I know I have personally, you've heard these people say it too, I have three to-go kits. You know, I have a three-day kit, I have a week kit, and then I get an extended kit that's at least a month to augment my three other kits. You know, um, if I went away long duration, I take it on camping with me. Crowbar. Crowbar. Um, and it's really important, the medication, personal items are the best. But these items uh, um, we're gonna show you just briefly is things that you can think about and give you ideas about what to add in your kit. Obviously everybody's uh, different, men and women, they have different needs and stuff. But like there's extra water bottles. Obviously you wouldn't need like a hard hat, you know. Um, it might not be a bad idea because if you were in like a tornado or a hurricane or something, you had to go outside. Who knows, you might need to protect yourself. But gloves are really important. Um, we, have, we have rope in ours, we got um, uh, heat blankets. That's little packets of blankets you can buy for a dollar at Ocean State Job Lot or Benny's. You know, those are great to keep yourself warm in the winter. In the summertime, you know, they reflect the heat as well. You can make a little canopy over you. Um, we have a flashlight in here as well. Frank was talking about flashlights. Um, he's the guru on electronics. You need anything, he's fantastic. There's also a uh, flashlight in that box right there. You can, I, I'm not sure how much they are, but th they also don't need any batteries. It's a hand crank battery one, or you, and then they have these shake ones, and it's also LED as well. Um, I'm not sure where they get it, but most of these supplies are uh, in the kit. First aid kits, you know, um, Band-Aids and stuff, you heard uh, the lady from Red Cross talk about there's so many Band-Aids and stuff. You know, if you, if you don't use it for yourself, you can use it for somebody else. Sunscreen is huge. You know, people don't think about sunscreen in the summertime. If, if you're out uh, on an incident or something out in the summertime, you know, burn is really bad. Um, insect repellent, I have a lot of insect repellent also in my kit. Um, two first aid kits, um, there's Oh yeah, <laughs> really good idea. The little uh, snack bars or energy bars. You know, um, Frank talked about the food situation. I have MREs, uh, the newer MREs, not the old C rations. But the C old C rations, they'll, 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 but they're very very high calorie. And now with with everything going on, um, they may not taste the best, but they're gonna keep you alive. You know, some of them have 2,500 calories just in one package. You know, this is what we don't think about. You know, you're at home, you're at the comfort of your home, you can go in your cabinet and reach for a can of beans or whatever, but if you had to move out quickly, the whole idea of to-go kit is to grab it and go. Because, you know, if you have a fire in your house, God forbid, you just grab it and you go because you're not gonna have enough time to put all this stuff together. That is the whole purpose for, bless you, to, for a to-go kit. Um, glow sticks, that's another really good one. If you, if you like say get in a car accident and you're down in a ditch in the woods, you know, you, could, you can't get out of the car for some reason. And if you can move, you have a flashlight, you have the stuff handy. 
you know, don't keep it in the trunk. Some people keep it in the trunk. It gets very hot in there, things melt. Um, if you have room in your car, keep it handy where you can keep it um, at arm's reach. First aid kits, you can never have enough of those duct tape. There's so many uses for duct tape, it's unbelievable. And with our kits, you'll notice it's more so, with a team, we're more hands-on. This isn't, this type of kit's not really for, um, just for basic survival. We have a bunch of stuff in our kits because um, we help the fire department. We man the shelter. We got, what, two minutes? We man the shelter, and you'll see people like uh, Melissa there, she has um, a cert vest on. If you're ever at the shelter or at any incident, you know, obviously fire, EMS, you're gonna see people in firefighter uniform, police, they're easy recognizable. Volunteers, like from the Red Cross, she was here, she, you know, she, she has her Red Cross. We as a cert team, we have uh, high visibility certain and our names all over it so if you ever have any questions or concerns you can come see one of us one of the police officers ems um, we do a lot of planned events too you'll see us at road races um, parades fourth of july um, it, it's just amazing all the members that we have on our team they're, they're all volunteers and they put put in so many hours just in the, um, the last um, 382 volunteer hours just at that one shelter for Hurricane Sandy. Or was it Nemo, the no name, the blizzard, excuse me. 382 hours and 15 CERT members, and we have 25 active. We have more members, but they're, we call them snowbirds. They go down to Florida and come back and stuff. But um, with only 15 members, we're able to staff, they put in 382 hours in the amount of five days. It's absolutely amazing. And we had other CERT teams come from off Cape to help us as well. Right. Um, it, it was fantastic. Is there any questions for, for us? We'll leave this out for a while. Maybe you can touch and feel it, get a hands eye idea. And also, it's really important, grab those brochures. There's so much information in there. It can be very overwhelming. Um, and if you ever have any questions, um, we have a, a website too. It's uh, yd at gmail, ydcert at gmail.com. But you can also look us up on the Yarmouth Fire Department website, uh, and then there'll be a little link on there as well for ydcert. And there's tons of information. Anything on FEMA or .gov or anything, you can get through the fire department website and the police department's websites. Anything else? Thank you. All right, so we're at the end.